Welcome to the 2005 Superbike Grand Test Moto and it is a grand test I tell you. More like 50 grand if you ask me. We've got five of the best litre bikes on the planet. Combined value? 50 grand. Ooh, don't tell the insurance man. <laughs> and we've taken them down to the bottom of France to our favourite stomping ground down in the Côte d'Azur. It's awesome down here. We've got awesome roads, fantastic weather. I mean look at it. The locals don't care. They love it. They, they egg you on. Absolutely. And we're going to spend the next two days thrashing the life out of these bikes on the roads around here. Then we're going to go to Misano in northern Italy. And then what are we going to do there? We're going to spend a day on there with Italian data logging. And uh, Paul Youngy Young, top British superstock racer, is going to come and show us what a real man makes of the bike. So really, this is Grand Test Moto. So Grand, 50 grand. Test, doesn't get more testing than this. Moto, uh, motorbike. So what bikes have we got for this grand test then, Simon? The 2004 Honda kept with the continuity thing and kept the name. And I think that was about it, wasn't it? Well, they kept the Fireblade, they changed the Big B to a little B, and they changed the 900 to a 1000. And did everything else to it. Joker in the pack, MV Augusta. F4-1000S. It's not often you come across one of these, is it? This looks like if it should cost 50 grand all on its own. If a bike's good, it's good. So if you want one of these, you need to act fast. You have to be friends with Mr Castiglione at the factory. Not us then? Not us, no. Loser. It's a GSX-R1000 K5. And how has that improved from the K4? Well, like all the other companies did last year, they basically took the old GSX-R1000, which was no slug, and just improved everything they could find on it. The GX-1000 was last in our test last year, so it's got a hell of a way to catch up. I mean, before last year, Kawasaki's entry was the ZX-9R. I a, can smell it from here, it's it a, was a stinker! Bit, a bit of a stinker and no mistake, yeah. But it's incredible that they've transformed the ZX-9 into this rabid machine. I would love it if this won. Love it. Here we've got last year's winner, Yamaha's R1. Sensational bike, this one. Very, very good motorbike. There's not much you can say bad about it. Last year when it was introduced, it was a big step up from the old R1s. Yeah, they've got to the point a wee bit with the old one, but they came right back with this one again. A lot of engine revisions, all the stuff was, was taken, sorted, put back in. Looks the bomb too. Five of the best, and no mistake. What have we got first? Arguably this is the bike that started it all, way back in 1992, Honda's Fireblade. Originally the 900, but it's gone up to 1,000 last year. But it lost its focus towards the end of the 90s, it became a bit softer, a bit rounder, easier to use. All the time it was getting faster and lighter and had better handling, you know, so don't forget that. This version came out last year, I rode it at the launch in Phoenix, Arizona. Very impressed with it, very easy bike to ride, it's not intimidating. Honda's worked on the mass centralisation in areas like that and, and focused on handling finesse rather than outright power and weight loss. The one thing Honda has done in this bike is fitted good tyres as standard. Bridgestone BT-014's fantastic tyre, you know, you, you can ride on the track reasonably hard on these, you can ride on the road. And compared to the Dunlops on the Kawasaki and the Yamaha, they just give you that bit more confidence which is essential when you're riding on the roads like these. This is the MV Augusta F4 1000. Very, very rare motorbike. In fact, it's so rare that we couldn't get one in Britain. We had to... Uh, get our Italian friends at Superbike Italia to bring this from the factory, so uh, we're quite pleased to have this here. You've seen the 750 on the roads, and this is basically very similar to that bike. The chassis, you've got the steel tube trellis frame, the single-sided swinging arm, you've got this gorgeous bodywork, which is catching the sun amazing today. But they've taken the engine, given it a pump-up capacity to the full 1000cc, and they've produced a stormer, they really have. It's so strong. On the dyno, it's making more power than the GSX R1000. So the Italians are beating the Japanese at their own game here, which is amazing when you think about it. Tiny factory up in, up in the mountains near Lake Varese. 
and they're churning out stuff like this. £14,000, big sack of money. So much you need to hand over to your dealer to get one of these, if you can find one, because they're in really short supply. A lot of money, a lot more than the Japanese competition. You know, it's £6,000 more than Suzuki. And in terms of pure performance, you're not really getting that much more for your money. You're paying for the ownership experience, you're paying for something that's fancy, you're paying for your exotic wheels, your exotic swinging arm. You're paying for the name, and if that's important to you, it's worth every penny. This is the big news for this year, 2005 GSX-R1000, and it's pretty much the reason that we're here doing this test. It's the only bike in this group test. It's had a complete revamp for the wheels up. It's all new, this bike. Starting at the front, the modifications for this year. The brakes, they've made the discs 10mm bigger. Calipers, basically the same as last year, but they've changed the size of the pistons inside the calipers, giving that a bit more power to the front. Battleaxe BT-014 tyre, they've changed that as well. Special tyre developed for, for the GSX-R1000. One of the areas Suzuki worked on a lot was the aerodynamics of the bike. They've made the nose cone a good bit sharper, narrower. They've moved these ram air ducts further in just to make them closer to the centre of the bike where you're getting the most pressure. They've moved the indicators up onto the mirrors just to give them maximum space down here to just fill it with the ram air duct and make it as narrow as they can. Now a lot of the other competition has moved to an under-seat exhaust. The R1's got it, the Honda's got it. Kawasaki's done it with a 600. But Suzuki will tell you that's all wrong because you're putting weight high up and, and far back. Suzuki reckons that this system here not only gives you loads of ground clearance with this triangular shape, but it's moved the mass of the exhaust sort of further forward and further towards the centre of the bike, which improves your handling, your turning, all that kind of stuff. So we're willing to overlook the ugliness if it makes the bike better. is Kawasaki's mightily impressive ZX-10R, which was released in 2004 to ecstatic reviews from the press and impressed everybody primarily for its uh, tiny size, its lightweight, its incredibly compact chassis and, and the power delivery. Um, it's got a slipper clutch, it's got upside down forks, it's got a decidedly MotoGP inspired uh, swinging arm as well. It was so close to winning our test last year, but it's slightly aggressive nature we thought might scare some people and might not be that appropriate for the road. So it got bumped to second. But if John Pearson had his way, it would have won. But he was outvoted. As Kenny said, the ZX-10 is such a small package of a bike. At the front, the thing that sets it apart is these petal front brake discs. They've got this scalloped edge on them. It's supposed to make them lighter, improve cooling when they're spinning. Up the front, you've got this big ram air duct sucking the air in right through between the headlights, and that actually goes right the way through the aluminium frame behind the forks, straight into the airbox, straight into the engine. It just builds the power. The faster you go, the more power it makes, the crazier it gets, till your head falls off. Kawasaki stuck with a side mount exhaust, uh, unlike the ZX6 of this year, which has got an under seat can. I expect to see that changing maybe next year, but I don't like it in green. This is the reigning champion in this test. Yamaha's R1 appeared last year, rocked our world. Just basically blew everybody away with the massive power, fantastic handling, classy styling. It had everything this bike last year. Swept the board in our later bike test. The only thing we've changed for this year is the paint, and it's this beautiful purpley grey silver thing, and it's really classy. And, and that's one of the things the R1 did last year. It just added that element of class, the quality of design, finish, fit, build quality. It just moved it all up a notch. Again, like the Fireblade, the R1 back in 1997 was the first kind of litre bike, if you like, to redefine the handling characteristics of the class again. You know, it, it gave you 600 cc handling uh, in, in a really small, tight package so easy, you just jump on it and immediately you can go really, really fast without even thinking about what you're doing. Brakes are amazing. Again, under seat exhaust, a lot of engine revisions, all new chassis, radial mount front brakes, new fuel injection, just all the stuff was, was taken, sorted, put back in. 
comes with these Dunlop tyres, which we're not very fond of here, you know, just they don't have that last extra wee percentage of grip that you would like as a, as a margin of error. They do everything they might have done in superbike racing, but you know, it won TT races, it done well in endurance racing, you know, clearly a lot to offer this bike. So then, it's the end of our road section. Let's have a little rundown of the bikes. What's in fifth place? I think it's got to be the MV. OK, I think we're all in agreement here. It's a great bike. Very expensive. Hard work on the road. The engine's really powerful, but it's not very user-friendly, is it? Fifth. Unlucky ducky. Fourth place goes to... It's tricky, but I think it's a Kawasaki. Just. Too much for the road? Well, I'll say no. Yeah. Because I had a long term last year and it's down to you how fast you go. That's true. But the big thing here is the tyres that it's on. The tyres decided. Those I, Dunlops are rubbish. I put decent tyres on mine and had an absolute blast yeah. all year. That's it then. So the Kawasaki fourth, all oh, regretfully. Third place? Under. Under. Honda Fireblade, who'd have thought? Mm. Mm. It's grown on me, the Honda. It's mild, milder mannered, I think, and that's why it goes a little bit higher up the list in the, in the, on the road. Nice to live with, it's not uh, not full of surprises, is it? No. It goes very fast, but... Easy to ride. Yeah. Yeah. Second, mm. Yamaha R1. Last year's winner. Second place this year. I can fault it in no way whatsoever. No. no. Apart from the tyres. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible down. It does, it does do better with those tyres than the Kawasaki, but... Yeah, I think that's an indictment of a slightly superior chassis and the suspension managed to deal with the power a little bit better. Like slightly lacklustre right at the bottom of the rev range maybe, That's, it's not, not as lively as you want some. So it feels like the gearing's not helping that as well, doesn't it? I was like, whatever. Which means that there's only one winner, it, Suzuki. Yeah. We're only halfway through, but the road test section's over. It is, but by far and away I think the Suzuki is the best bike. Alright, there's not much in it, but it makes it clear that the Suzuki is the best bike out there. It's got the ease and controllability of something like the Fireblade, and it's even crazier than the R1 or the ZX10. Definitely. Yeah, it makes going fast very easy. Mm. It's great fueling. Comfortable, yeah, definitely. When will my long termer arrive? And welcome to Mizano. Well, it's taken us forever to get here from the south of France. Had one or two problems on the way, but we've made it. Right, the plan for today is put on some Pirelli Super Corsa Evos, which are the stickiest tyres that the Italian manufacturer makes. Take the five bikes and wazz them as quickly as we can around Mizano's circuit. We're keeping the suspension settings stock. To be honest, we haven't got the time to mess about with them all. And as they are, they're pretty good. But they're there. It costs nothing to have a fiddle about with your settings. So why don't you do it? What I'm looking for on a uh, bike on the track is for it to steer well, especially this place like this has got so many corners and got fast corner, very, 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 very fast corners and tight hairpins. So you need a bike to to, uh, to turn well in both sort of sort of corners. Some of these bikes have got a lot of kit on them, a lot of expensive suspension and stuff. And they're not going that fast, really. <laughs> The standard setup was fine for around a track. I mean, as fast as I go, they are, yeah, fine, definitely. It's always interesting coming on the track because it gives you a different perspective to the road. If the bikes are narrower than I expected, and I'm finding it even more interesting this time because I thought the differences between the bikes were more obvious on the road. How do you draw a conclusion from track and road testing? It's mostly based on feel for me. And, and the consensus of opinion. I talk to everyone that's done, that's ridden the bikes. You, you pick up things from other people. That's 
that's the way it is. And generally, people say the same things. No matter how fast they are or how slow they are, they tend to say that these bikes feel certain ways, and that's how you come to a conclusion. I've counted them all out, and I'm stood here counting them all back in now. But there's one bike missing, and I've got a very terrible feeling in my tummy that it could be Paul Young. For the afternoon, we decided to put some GPS loggers on to do some accurate lap timing, and not only does it record laps, but it records fuck-ups as well. And they've just downloaded the data from the GPS satellites, and apparently at 166 kilometers an hour, the person in question fell off. It was a high side, really, on, on cold tires. The actions of what we can only call a young juvenile man, but he's all right. Oh, it's lucky you've come along when you did, because I have got a deal for you. We don't get many of these along very often, and when they do, they just go like hotcakes out of the shop. So for today, and today only, I can get you a ZX-10R for practically peanuts. How shall I describe it? It's probably a renovator's dream in the estate agent lingo, which means, you know, it needs some work on it. A few scratches here and there, but overall, it's a sound, sound bike, and you won't get much better value for the money. Take a look. It doesn't take its original form. The previous owner has made a few interesting developments with it, taken off some of the plastic, as you can see, and daubed it with this very interesting, almost bird shit like effect, which I think is stunning and it works really, really well. At the front, you can see this light arrangement, very important for wheelies in the dark, and if you're riding along in the dark and you ever need to know what's above you, then that's perfect. Elsewhere, you can see a few lovely little scuffs on the engine casing. They've done done a really professional job on that it's fantastic and at the back we've got the can you, you, know, you might want a new can on that you might not I mean I quite like it I'd keep it on plastics at the back I've got the lovely certain piquants about it just a fantastic way that the, the owner is just shredded through them like that absolutely fine price let's start haggling But if you're after some bits, lele at superbikeitalia.it. So two days on the road, a day on the track, sunny for three days, thousands of miles. What does it all mean? Run down from five to one. We've got Paul here with us to give us his views on each of the five bikes. So Paul, let's do a let's do things in reverse. Which is the the fifth best bike? Um, I think it's going to have to be the MV. I was expecting you to really like it because you really loved the 750, didn't you? Yeah, I, the 750 was an amazing thing to, for me. I rode it at Brands and uh, it steered better than most race bikes I've ever had to had to race or raced. But, um, yeah, and it and it's missing that that shrill howl of the 750 that made it exciting to ride. So bottom of the pile for Paul. MV Augusta. Yeah. yeah. Didn't excel on the track either. I did well, yeah. It's, uh, Gained a few points on track. track but it, yeah, it's much more uh, at home on the track, so you, you feel a lot happier riding it there. But yeah, overall, you've got to spend a lot more time on the road than you have on the track when you buy a bike. True. True. That ain't so good. So what's fourth? The blade, it's, it's, it's heavy, uh, it's slower, it's a comfortable, fast ride. Um, yeah, with, with no surprises. When you were racing one at the start of last year? The biggest problem racing it was the lack of revs. Every time you hit the rev limiter, the Yamaha and the Suzuki have got another 1,000 RPM and therefore another 15 metres. And also the weight was, was a bit of a problem on the brakes, trying to pull the thing up. But in this context where they're all straight off out of the box, it's not a bad thing at all. So a bit of a porker for Paul. I really enjoyed it. It's the first time I've really, really got on with it. and. I, it opened my eyes. I didn't need to. Well, that's because you're all some ham-fisted wheelie artist. <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> but good bike, but I can see the point of it being a bit too lardy, not really exciting enough in the engine, a bit soft at the front, 
lacks a goal, it lacks a bit of power really. He gets left behind by the others. Yeah, that's it. And third up is the Kawasaki was uh, was exceptional. It just didn't didn't quite match up in the uh, in the Super Bowl at the end of the day. Um, Chatter problems or anything like that? Rear end traction problem actually. Yeah, yeah. Not couldn't can't quite put my finger on it, but. Um, uh, sometime around the time when I was looking at the, the rear of the back tyre, I thought we might have a bit of a problem. <laughs> Did you experience any any of these rear grip issues that Paul was talking about? No, it's, it's amateurs at work, that's the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> for some people that will be number one. Mm. Yeah. Not this year, but... No, well, for those no. that aren't, haven't been locked up yet. <laughs> Last year, for some people, that was number one, you know, the ZX-10. Mm, me? Yeah. You mean? Is that who you're looking at? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can't see who I'm looking at, because I'm in a booth. <laughs> yeah, just I, I rate it really high, because it's so exciting. But, and my, and my motorbike should be exciting. But too much on the road, and it hasn't got the, the blend that the GSX-R1000 has. No, it's not, it's not quite so uh, easy to live with. So that leaves the last two. What's it going to be? What's in second? The Suzuki, because I'm riding a Yamaha this year. <laughs> <laughs> Boo! <laughs> Rubbish. <laughs> no, no, I'm afraid it is the Yamaha in a very, very close second. Um, just that last degree of ability to turn in the middle of a corner. That it's so close that it's, it's, it's a very, very hard thing to call. But I think the Yamaha's, it feels quicker up top. It's got that real real rush real kick just you know in the top top part of the revs and that puts a slight unpredictability to it and just just its ability in the middle of the corner to change direction at uh, the last moment just pulls it a little bit behind the suzuki so you're racing one in super stock this year what sort of things do you do to that to, to compensate for that last degree of the suzuki you're only allowed to change front and rear suspension it fork internals shock exhaust and that's about your lot, really. So it's just a matter of finding where the uh, the ride heights and the uh, suspension settings are going to going to let it pull back in the middle of a corner. A man qualified to talk about R1s now. He had a long termer last year, and he's ridden the Virgin BSB bikes a few times and voted it last year's winner. What about 2005? I think the difference for me is that the Suzuki feels like it's it's already there. It's already really good in, in all of the areas it needs to be good for someone like me to ride around a track or ride along the road whereas the R1 would need a little bit of adjusting basically. Because last year you did quite a lot to your long term didn't you and the things that you did would probably bring it up to the level of the Jixa? I decided what I felt would make it a better bike and that was making the, the shock a little bit better and raising the ride height slightly and just freeing up the power a little bit more. That, that, those are the things, it's not a lot, but it's extra money, and, and if, if Suzuki's already there, and already feels that good, then that's the winner, really. Yeah. This is onboard footage, looking back at the R1 from the Suzuki. It's a pretty good illustration of the differences between last year's winner of our litre bike test, the R1, and the new GSX R1000. It shows how the Yamaha is slightly quicker steering, a bit more nimble, a bit more comfortable for the rider, but the Suzuki wins ultimately and makes a faster lap time because it's got a much better engine. We've just crossed the start-finish line at the Mizano track and you can see that the Suzuki has left the R1 behind down the straight. As we come into the sequence of corners, first a right, then another faster right, and then a slower left. You can see the R1 gaining ground on the Suzuki all the time. It's sort of quicker, easier to get on with the R1 because it steers slightly quicker and is nimbler on its feet. Then as we come out the sequence of left-handers, you can see I'm gaining ground on the, on the Suzuki all the time. And then as we accelerate out of that slow left and then increasingly get faster and build up speed through left, left, left onto the back straight, I'm finding it quite easy on the R1 to keep with the Suzuki because I'm quite happy steering it through those fast bends. Come out the final fast left, listen to the engine note, and you'll hear the Suzuki open its throttle. That's Igor from Superbike Italy. And at that point, the Suzuki just pulls away. That's the difference, basically. This is what's made the difference this year between the R1, which was first last year and is now second, and brought the GSX-R from last right up to first. Faultless in my book. 
faultless, but not as good as Suzuki. No, yeah, so it's probably yeah. we've done nothing wrong. Does that make sense? And be quite, be quite as good. But a fantastic bike, great chassis, sensational package, great engine. Tires could be better. Well, they can be better. Exactly. And what you do is you go to your local tire shop and say, remove these now, my man. <laughs> and uh, here's 200 pounds for a new set. 200 pounds? 200 pounds. Our one. Mm. Second. Last year's winner, this year's runner up. Paul, Suzuki winning? And Suzuki's won it by a whisker. It's, uh, it, it's amazing how close to a race setup the bike feels as it comes now it's it, it's hard to imagine you know, where you'd start, what you'd do, and how much you'd need to make it uh, into a super stock race bike because it feels that close as it is. And for you, JP, clear winner or not much in it? Yeah, not much in it. But maybe on the road there's a, a clearer difference. I feel, but perhaps I feel like the Suzuki's a little bit better on the road. You know, there's a bigger gap between it and the rest. It's lucky we stood by it then. So you've heard it, the superbike litre test winner is the Suzuki GSX-R1000. The king is dead. Long live the king. What can you say about it other than lots of expletives? It's pure at the bottom. A mental motor. So good, so much power, but it's all really accessible. Just go and buy one now. It's as simple as that. <laughs> Don't listen to us, fools. Well, just check it out. You can't beat it, so join it. So good I can't get a word in edgeways. and we've sat, found something very, very exciting. A lesser spotted road tester. We need to be very quiet. We don't want to disturb him. What can you see, Richard? Well, we see him here in his natural environment, writing cliches, perfecting his lines, talking about knees scraping the tarmac, and what about the famous, it handles like it's on wheels? Classic stuff from the blue and yellow lesser spotted road tester there, definitely, definitely. We better, um, we better be a bit quiet because he's looking a bit frightened. I think it's mating season and this is part of the ritual of getting and finding a mate. What happens then? You can see he's got his mating plumage on the blue and yellow romper suit, which is a classic, typical of this, 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 this specimen. Who is he likely to attract? Gay men. Never let it be said that we make an ass of ourselves with Superbike. Hee haw! Hey! So we ride it now? What's the handlebars? Oh, lovely donkey. A couple of very special guest testers we've, we've bumped into down here, down in France, we're down by the coast. A couple of fishy friends for us here. We've got uh, Patrice et Pascal. <laughs> Come and tell you, <laughs> I'm mega, thanks very much. <laughs> I'm mega too, thanks. Great to meet you, Alan, lad. You speak very good English, where did you learn that? Newcastle. <laughs> what about the Suzuki, Pascal? Oh, fucking great. I'm glad you asked me that one. There's the keys there, man. I'd, if I had hands, I'd take it off you. <laughs> if I could gun on it now. <laughs> And gun on and drive into That's the cool. sea, probably. It's lovely here. We're finished for the day. Pool looks great. Let's go. I don't know what you got me to in looking at this, but if you ever want to park your bike, what the perfect location. Get a big in there. No, oh, I've seen enough. Oh, I'm not gay or out. Nothing at all to do with the game then. What game? Oh, that's my phone. <laughs> Hello. Hiya. 
The game is switch your phone to silent, you're useless. Oh, it's a private number. Private number as well. Hiya. Put it on speakerphone, she is. Oh, I know. Oh, might, be. might be what? Maybe, Maybe you're a gay lover. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> right. This is what's made the difference this year between... Fuck it, I can't read my writing, you're right. Absolutely right. That's what's made the difference with. <laughs> Oh yeah. no! Fuck sake! Do we need to keep talking? Or? No. no. Is that enough? Yeah. Sorry. When do we get paid for this? <laughs> the penis by the word. <laughs>